What's up, Radiant Church, 11 a.m.? Everybody good? Yes, coffeeed up, we're ready to roll. All right, fantastic. We gotta, we gotta get through a lot today. So we'll, we'll, I'll talk fast and you'll listen fast and it'll be good. So hey, we're glad you're here. My name's John, I'm the campus pastor here at Richland. And uh, as Caleb said, we hope you had a great 4th of July. Everybody has both hands and 10 fingers still. And, uh, and here's the thing. This is pure Michigan weather, right? It's like 75, it's gorgeous. And so I said to the Lord in my prayer closet, where was this weather when I was moving last weekend? And it was 187 degrees. And God just told me that he disciplines those that he loves. So I just said, okay, fine, I'll take it. But we did move into our, our, our house and uh, we're getting settled. We have less boxes in the garage. And uh, we met our neighbors. We have incredible neighbors. So we had this sweet... A uh, couple across the street whose who's, uh, kids are grown out of the house, but their grandkids are over. Come over with an edible arrangement, like this beautiful fruit thing that, that we all ate, and a card, and just, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. And so we have this, this dog, uh, Samson. He's a Bernice Mountain dog. He's like 110 pounds, but he's a super lap dog, you know, sweet dog, but he's big. So we've been letting him out, and I don't have his harness right now, so I've just been hoping. Here's, here's his obedience level. He'll come back in as long as there's, like, nothing better for him to do. That's kind of, and so I'm, like, I've been having this string of luck while I let him out, and then he's almost ready to come back in, but then this sweet lady who came over and, and brought us a fruit basket opens her door to let out her little, like, four-pound, 13-year-old dog so it could go out and I was like, well, this is over. And Samson runs across the street, and he's so excited, and he's trying to play with her, and she's not really having it. So I run across her. I'm like, oh, sorry. He's really friendly. Don't worry. And, you know, we reintroduce ourselves. And then, like, 30 seconds in, Samson bolts into their house. <laughs> like, the doors open a little bit and just runs in and then just starts running around their living room. They have, like, white carpet. I'm like, what are you doing? And then literally bolts upstairs. <laughs> like, make yourself at home, Samson. So they have this like butler thing that, that's like a mannequin, but it looks real or whatever. And he's like trying to get that thing to pet him because he's so starved for affection. And I'm like, Samson, I'm like, I'm so sorry. He never does this, you know? And so I, which was true. And I grab him and I bring him down literally at that moment. So this is at like 7.30 in the morning, eight in the morning. Eric, my five-year-old son, opens the front door and he's in this stage right now where he's like telling everybody he loves them. And it's sweet, but it's not always like contextual. You know what I mean? Like, I love you. I just love you. And so, you know, I'm sitting there grabbing my dog by the collar. He's like, ah, choking it. And I'm talking to the neighbor. And then my son opens the door, screams across the street, Dad, don't leave without me. I love you. <laughs> and I'm like, no one's leaving without you, Eric. No one has ever left without you. So now my neighbors think my dog is vicious and my kids have separation issues. But other than that... Welcome to the neighborhood. Everything's been good. So uh, we're in a series. It's called Heroes. We're looking at the lives of people in the Old Testament. We're doing it all summer. We have a few more weeks left of um, people that God used, normal, I would say, people that God used in supernatural ways to advance the kingdom of God and the plans and purposes he had for his people. And every time that I've spoke, I've said, remember, this is still how God uses people today. When God wants to introduce a, a movement, when God wants to do something in the earth, he doesn't just snap his fingers and make it happen. He uses people all the way up to the, the introduction of Jesus Christ. When God knew there was a sin issue that had to be addressed, he didn't just wave a wand, he didn't just snap his fingers. No, there was an incarnation. God became flesh. Jesus was born a baby and raised and, and discipled and, and God uses people to further the plans and purposes that he has. So we've been looking at the lives of these people, and today uh, we're, we're going to look at a young lady whose name is Esther. So if you brought your Bible, turn to the book of Esther. It's right after Nehemiah. It's before Job. Go to Psalms maybe. Back up a few books, and you will find Esther. And so Esther is a very unique, unique book of the Bible. And so it's going to be a little challenging, but we're going to get through it in, in several ways. First of all, obviously, it, it, the Esther is a woman. There's only two books in the entire Bible out of 66 that are named after a woman. There's Esther and there's Karen. No, it is Ruth. You're right. <laughs> Esther and Ruth, that's it. So it's unique in that sense. Also, it is 10 chapters and it never mentions God uh, by name. You never hear the word God, the word Yahweh, the word Jehovah 
is never mentioned, and yet the fingerprint of God is all throughout the story as we'll look. But it's the only book that doesn't do that, and it's one of only three books where no author in the New Testament uh, mentions Esther or the book. It's never quoted again in the New Testament. So it has these really unique dynamics. It never mentions God in ten chapters, but it mentions partying in seven chapters. Uh, so you tell me. I don't know what that means. Why'd they give this one to me? Well, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, and so it's interesting. Also, if you did read it, which I said to do on Facebook, and of course everyone listens on Facebook, but I said it reads like a guiding light as the world turns episode meets Fabio romance cover novel. It's, it's a book about immorality, indulgence. It's about jealousy, rage. It's got all of these interesting components, and yet here it is smack dab in the middle of Scripture. So there's something powerful about the story of Esther that God wants us to know. And, and God wants us to reveal to us that this isn't just something that happened 2,500 years ago that we just kind of skimmed through, but there are principles and there are things within the story of Esther that is really God's story that we're involved in and that we glean from 2,500 years later. And so Esther is a book that has 10 chapters, but the entire book is one story. So you might go through like Kings or Chronicles where there's 39 or whatever chapters, but there's all kinds of narratives. There's different kings and all these different people where you can kind of like pick and choose. We literally only have one story in all 10 chapters of Esther that we have to get through. So hopefully no one made dinner plans. We'll be out of here by seven at the latest. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to go through it. And I'm going to stop at a few points and I'm going to highlight some things that I felt like God gave me this week for us corporately and for us as individuals to meditate on, but I'm going to sort of highlight the story of Esther to you. So it's going to be story time with Pastor John. Everybody have like a blankie, some warm milk, something like that. We're going to jump into the story of Esther, and it's going to be good. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We ask you during this time, let the entrance of your word bring light and bring understanding to us, your people. Open the eyes of our hearts, reveal to us what you want to say. Holy Spirit, you are intimately involved in our lives. You know every single person in this room, every situation we've entered this sanctuary with, God, and I ask you, do not let your word return void. Let it be sent out to heal, save, deliver, admonish, and encourage your people in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Esther, there's four main people in the book of Esther that we're going to be introduced to, all right? The first one in chapter one is called King Xerxes. He's the Persian king. He's about 35 years old at this time. He's only been in power for about four years, but he is the epitome of opulence, of indulgence, of wealth. He has 127 provinces that are under his care, and he has every single thing at his whim, his disposal, his back and his call. He's the ultimate like silver spoon Persian playboy. He's never had to work a day in his life. His dad was a king. He grew up in the palace. He grew up having everything that he could possibly want. And he lives that way. He's everything about wealthy people that we don't like, that we stereotype. Like he's bragging and he's, you know, thinks he's all that. And he has all of this going for him. And he makes sure everybody knows that. So in the very first chapter, he's in the middle of a party that he threw that lasted 180 days. How many of you have ever thrown a party that lasted 180 days? Young man in the back, come here, serious. No, I'm just kidding, no one does that. No one, and so in the last week of this party that he's throwing, where he's just bragging about all that he has, he says, everybody, I want you to drink without any limits, I want you to just enjoy yourselves. In the last week, he gets this bright idea where he says to his assistants, his eunuchs, he says, I want you to go and get my wife, get Queen Vesti. And bring her out here because I want to brag about her. I want everyone to see her. She's beautiful. I want to set her up like one of the other things that I own. And I want everybody to just be like, whoa, he must be pretty important because look at his wife. So that's his plan. How many think that's a great plan? Guys, you with me? Okay, good. No, terrible plan. But he sends his eunuchs to go do that. And guess what? Queen Vesti says, how about no? <laughs> no, thanks. I'm not coming. And King Xerxes is shocked, literally. Like his jaw hits the floor. My, 
She said no. She can't say no. Nobody says no to me. He literally, this is humorous, gets all of his counsel and advisors together. Like he calls Congress. What are we going to do? My wife said no to me. I mean, what can we do? What are the laws? Like, what do I have the right? I mean, what, what? And so they, they say, oh, my, we can't have this. What if other people's wives say no to them? What if this becomes a thing? All throughout the provinces, we have to, something has to be done now. And so they put their minds there. I know what we'll do. We'll pass a law and we'll, we'll send it out to everybody in the kingdom saying, wives can't say no. I thought that was only my house where we had that law. And no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so that's what they do. It's ridiculous, right? And they send it out and they say, well, what are we going to do about the queen? And they say, I know what we'll do. We're going to banish her. She's never going to be able to come in your presence again. And we're going to find you a better queen. And the king's like, that's a fabulous idea. You guys are so smart. Let's get me a better queen. So that's the plan. So and then in chapter two, so that's King Xerxes. He's weird. And then in chapter two, we, ha- we meet the, the next character. His name is Mordecai. And he's a Jewish man. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. And he came because he was exiled when the Babylonians sieged Israel back in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar. I talked about it last week. And so he came with them because they were taken prisoner. But now the Persian government has overtaken Nebuchadnezzar. So now they're Jewish people living in Persia as Jewish people. And he has a cousin whose name is Hadassah or Esther who lost both of her parents. And so he's basically raising her as his own daughter. And the Bible says that she is beautiful to behold. She's just a a stunning young lady in every sense. And and so she catches the attention of one of the king's assistants who's trying to find the next queen. Because they sent a letter out. Hey, we're looking for the next queen. It's like the original Bachelor show is happening. We're looking for the next queen. It could be you. And we're going to find... And so he notices Esther and he says, whoa, whoa, you could, you, could, you could be the one. Come with me. And this isn't like, hey, we'll stop at the mall and quick get a glamour shot. This is 12 months of prepping before you even get to see the king. The Bible says there's six months of just lotions and essential oils. And then there's six more months of like perfumes and fragrances or something like that. And then you get brought before the king. And if he wants to keep you, you stay in this house for future queens and wives. And that's your new place of residence. So Esther gets taken there. And the Bible says that when she's presented before the king, she has favor. And so the king says, oh my, he's, he's taken. He's Twitter paid it immediately by her and says, you're the one. You're it. Puts the crown on her. And instantly Esther goes from this nameless, faceless, obscure Jewish girl living with her cousin Mordecai to the queen of the most powerful empire in the entire world in one instance. That's what happens to her. And then Mordecai is also given a position as an officer. So he has authority all of a sudden. And he tells her, here's what I want you to do. Don't tell the king about your nationality or your origin. Don't tell them that you're Jewish. Just keep that to yourself. So she does, and she enters the palace, and this happens. And then the Bible says that Mordecai is outside the gates because he's one of the officers, and he overhears two of the king's guards who are frustrated with the king, and they're planning an assassination of the king. They want to kill him. And so Mordecai overhears that, tells Esther. Esther tells the king on behalf of Mordecai. An investigation happens. Those two guys are found guilty, And they're impaled and killed in front of everyone. And the Bible says that that's written in the book of the kings, in the book of of the Persian kings and laws. And and that's chapter 2 of the book. And then in chapter 3, so we've met King Xerxes, right? We've met Esther. We've met Mordecai. The fourth person in chapter 3 is a man named Haman. Haman is a weasel. Haman is the worst. He's insecure. He's a full of pride, he, he wants power for all the wrong reasons, and the king actually promotes him and says, I want you to be my chief officer, which kind of makes sense because King Xerxes is immature and insecure too, so he's attracting people like him. So yeah, I kind of like this guy. And so he gives him this position, and he says, you're going to be my number two guy, and, and of course that all goes to Haman's head. He's like, yes, I have power, I have authority. People have to bow down, and the Bible says literally every other officer bowed down to Haman out of fear and out of respect every time that he walked by except for Mordecai. Mordecai wouldn't do it. And the other officers were like, how come you don't bow down? How come you don't bow down? And he wouldn't answer them. And so they went to Haman and said, hey, there's somebody 
who's not bowing down with the rest of us. And Haman was so upset. I mean, this just ruined his pride and ruined his attitude so bad that he determined, I'm not only going to kill Mordecai, I'm going to kill every single Jewish person. I'm going to kill his entire race. And so in chapter 3, he goes before the king, and he tricks him. And he says, listen, there's, there's a people group who live within your kingdom who aren't like us. They don't want to acclimate to our culture. They don't worship the same gods. They don't do the same things. And they're a threat to you, king. And we shouldn't keep them around. And I'm willing to take them out. I'm willing to annihilate and kill and destroy them. In fact, I'll give you 10,000 bags of silver into the treasury of the kingdom if you let me do it. And the king says, sure, that's fine. Do whatever you need to do. And he says, a law is passed with a king's signet ring saying that on a certain day, every single Jewish person is to be destroyed within all 127 provinces, to be killed by the Persians. And if you end up killing one of these Jewish people, you get to keep all of their stuff too. In one moment, he seals the fate for every single Jewish person, including Mordecai and including the family of Esther. And so that's where we are in chapter four. So if you're in Esther, I'm gonna read out the New Living Translation. This is the, the next part of the story. So there's the backdrop, that's where we began. And it says in verse, or chapter four, verse one, that when Mordecai learned about all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap and ashes. He went out into the city crying with a loud and a bitter wail. He went as far as the gate of the palace for no one was allowed to enter the palace while wearing clothes of mourning. And as news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, they wept, they wailed. Many people lay in burlap and ashes. And when Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was deeply distressed. So she sent clothing to him to replace the burlap, but he refused it. Then Esther sent for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed as her attendant. She ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him, why he was in mourning. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the square in front of the palace gate. And Mordecai told him the whole story, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. And Mordecai gave Hathak a copy of the decree issued that called for the death of all the Jews. And he asked Hathak to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hathak to direct her to go to the king, beg for mercy, and plead for her people. So Hathak returned to Esther with Mordecai's message. So Mordecai's upset. Esther hears about it. She's a little isolated and insulated because she's been in the palace. And she says, what's wrong? And so she sends an assistant and Mordecai tells him, there's a decree. We're all going to be killed. We're all going to be wiped out. Our, our, our fate is sealed. And I need you to tell Esther to go before the king and beg and plead for the life of her people. And so in verse 10, it says, then Esther told Hathak, her assistant, to go back and relay this message. All the king's officials and even the people in the province know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king hasn't called for me to come to him for 30 days. So Hathak gave Esther's message to Mordecai. So she hears what's happening. She hears the charge that Mordecai gives her to go and talk to the king. But she says, look, it's not that simple. You don't just knock on the door and say, hey, can I talk to you? If you're not asked, if you're not summoned, and you go into the king's inner courts, you're killed. The only hope you have is that if the king's in a good mood, he extends his gold scepter and pardons your life. And she tells Mordecai, I haven't even been asked to see the king for 30 days. So this isn't as easy as it sounds. And then this is the part in Esther that most of us know. It says, Mordecai sent this reply. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. And then Esther sent this reply, go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast. Don't eat or drink for three days. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. So Mordecai went away and did everything Esther had ordered him. The reason we're going to stop here and talk about this is because none of the miracles that we see happening in a few chapters in the book of Esther and the story of the Jewish people and the story of her family, none of that takes place unless this moment happens in Esther's life. 
None of that comes to fruition unless Esther makes a decision that I'm willing to risk something for the cause of Christ, for God to move in my generation and to move in my family. She hears this challenge from Mordecai and says to her, look, don't fool yourself into thinking you're going to be okay. You might be for a while, but listen, God might have to raise somebody else. But think about this. Just ponder and wonder. Maybe it was for this season. Maybe it was for just such a time as this that you were made the queen, that you went from obscurity to the palace, that God made you beautiful, that God gave you favor, that you went before the king and he selected you. Maybe that isn't all coincidence. Maybe God's saying, this is the time for you to rise up and do what I've called you to do. And I feel like in the church today, the same message is being asked by God. Are you willing to risk something for the cause of Christ in your life? Esther said, if I must die, I must die. She had to make a tough decision and say, I'm willing to risk something in order to fulfill the plans and purposes that God's asking me to do. And the same thing is true. This isn't 2,500 years ago, and now God doesn't do that anymore. God looks at every person in this room, every person who professes Christ as Lord, and says, you are in Esther. You are here for such a time as this. It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. I don't have you here by chance. I have you here because you are called to reach where you work, where you go to school. Your family, your neighborhood are all mission fields for you to do something in the kingdom of God. And that's what we have to realize. We're not just trying to get by, we're not just trying to to hunker down and, and hope things get better or hope we can just get through it. We don't believe that for our kids. No, we start positioning ourselves and our children to be light, to be influencers, to be pillars in the kingdom of God. But it's gonna take a measure of risk. You're gonna be willing to maybe sacrifice some friendships, sacrifice some people not agreeing with you or not liking you. Sometimes we measure our, our, our faith or our commitment by are we willing to, to trust God when we have nothing to lose? You know, it's our rock bottom or there's nothing else I can do, nowhere else I can go. God, I trust you. Those aren't the real moments. The real moments are when, like Esther, you have everything to lose. Esther already lived in the kingdom. She already was in the palace. She'd already been elevated. Now, she has a real decision to make because there's a lot of risk involved. I could lose all of this. I don't know if if Mordecai's right. Maybe it won't get found out. I didn't tell anybody I was Jewish. I could be okay. All that's going through her mind. I'm telling you today, 2018, the same thing goes through our minds when we're at work, when we're at school. Maybe I'll just say nothing. Maybe I'll just go and blend with the crowd. And God's saying, are you willing to come out of your comfort zone to do something powerful for Jesus, to be used in a way that the rest of the world might not understand, the rest of the world might not see the value, but you know God's calling you to do something that's beyond what everybody else is doing. Are you willing to come out of your comfort zone? Because that's what it's going to take. And listen, in American culture, we're obsessed with comfort. Let's be honest. Everything is designed for our comfort. Our chairs, right? We don't come home from a hard day of work and want to sit down and watch TV. We don't sit on a log cabin pine, right? No, we have a chair. It's comfortable. You sit in, you recline, you kick your feet up. It gets the paper for you. It turns the TV, it cracks your beer, your Diet Coke, whatever it is. <laughs> we, we're, we're obsessed with comfort. The cars that we have, they have these seats, they have lumbar support. Oh my God, oh, that's perfect. Now we have cars that even parallel park for you. Heck no. Young people, you have to feel the discomfort of running a few cones over, trying to parallel park. Even our beds. We have sleep numbers now. No, I need it four more up for per... Oh, yes, there it is. Listen, remember we were talking to, I think it was Kendra's great-grandmother. It was like 900 or something, but she's older, 90. And she was like, I grew up with like 11 siblings and we all slept in the same room until I was 19 years old on the floor. And I was like, well, one time I didn't adjust the sleep number and I had like a crink in my neck for like four hours. No, we don't know what uncomfortability is. And and when you're sleeping, it's fine to be comfortable. When you are being used by God, it is the assassin of your destiny. 
Comfort is. Apathy. It doesn't matter. God will raise somebody else up. I just got to get by. I, I'm not a mission. I'm not a loud person. I'm not. We come up with all these excuses. It's time to look at the life of Esther and say, maybe, just maybe, God has you where you are for such a time as this. It's not tomorrow. It's not somebody else. It's not the next generation. Right now, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, the Bible says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Take advantage of the time that you've been given. Get outside of your comfort zone and believe God to use you to do powerful, powerful things for his kingdom. So that's number one. Second thing. So here's, we, we continue the story. It says, on the third day of the fast, chapter five, Esther put on her royal robes, entered the inner court of the palace, and the king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance. And when he saw the queen standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and he held out the gold scepter. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. So this moment where she's scared, she's been fasting, everyone's been praying, it's okay. The king accepts her. And the king asks her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What's your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. And Esther replied, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet that I've prepared for the king. So the king turned to his attendants and said, tell Haman to come quickly to a banquet as Esther has requested. So the king and Haman went to Esther's banquet. So he says, what do you want me to do? She says, I want to throw another party. Let's go. Let's have a banquet. And you and Haman come to it. And so they do. They're excited. And it's in this moment that Esther feels like it's the time for her to tell the king everything. Look, I'm a Jew. Haman's trying to kill us. He wants to kill all of my family and all of my people, and I need you to do something about it. Like, this is the moment. So in verse 6, at this feast, it says, while they were drinking wine, the king said to Esther, now tell me what you really want. What is your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. Verse 7, this is it. This is the moment. Esther replied, this is my request. This is my deepest wish. If I found favor with the king, if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I ask, then please come with me and Haman tomorrow to another party. <laughs> she like bails. <laughs> this is it. He's like, I'll give it to you. What is it? Okay, this is it. If I've ever pleased you, if I've, if I've ever, you know, if you're going to grant my request, this is it. I need you to come back tomorrow. Let's have another party. Isn't that weird? I read that and I go, this is so strange. That was her moment. This was the time. And yet there, for some reason, she wasn't able to do it. Or she felt like she shouldn't do it. Or this wasn't the time. And I, I'm trying to figure that out. I tried to study it. I don't know. I, I wasn't there. I'm not sure exactly what her reasoning was. But here's what it, in, I guess, inspired me to believe God for. Is that sometimes the timing of what God is doing in our lives is different than what we think it should be. Sometimes there's, there's things we're going through, there's situations we're, we're, we're navigating in our lives and we think, if I was God, I would have done this already. Or this needs to happen. If this situation, my marriage, my kids, my family, my finances, my, the things I'm struggling with, if those are gonna get better, then God's gonna have to do this. And this is gonna have to be the timing and this is how he's gonna have to do it. And sometimes we get so fixated on how we think God should be moving, that we miss what he's actually doing in our lives. We miss the timing. We miss the process. We miss the things that God is aligning in order to make victory happen in our lives. So, so, so she doesn't do it. She says, I want to have another party. So I just want you to hear what happens in a sequence of 24 hours after she decides not to say something. Haman goes home, and he's on his way home, and he's happy. He's like, I'm second in command. I go to exclusive parties with only the king and only Esther. I get invited to these. And, and, and he's just as happy as can be, but then he sees Mordecai. And Mordecai doesn't bow down to him again. And it just flips the switch. And he's so mad and he's so angry and he goes home and he tells his wife, I was having a great day. I go to cool parties. And then Mordecai, he won't even bow down to me. And I can't even enjoy my life because I hate this guy. He's a baby. He's the worst baby. And I don't know what to do. And, and his wife, you know, I would want my wife to say something like, hey, I'll make us a huge ice cream sundae. And we'll eat it. 
and just go crazy. I know, or, or something like, I know, we'll, we'll binge on Netflix. Amen. You'll feel better. Just relax. Here, get in this comfy chair. Do you know what she says to him? She says, I know what you should do. You should build a 75-foot pole in the gallows, and then you should put Mordecai on it and pale him and kill him on it, and then go to your party. And Mordecai and Haman was like, oh, that's so sweet, honey. Thank you. That's a great idea. That's what I'm going to... Why didn't I think of that? Perfect. So they build it. 75 foot gallows with a huge pole. And they're going to put, and he says, I'm going to go ask the king if I can do that. I'm going to get his permission. So he walks over to the palace. The Bible says that the king has insomnia that night. He can't sleep. So he tells one of his assistants, I want you to read me a book. Read me the book of the kings and, and help me go to sleep. So he starts reading this book and by chance starts to read about the story of Mordecai finding out that those two guards wanted to plot an assassination. And, and he tells the queen and, and, and the king is saved. So the king's hearing this as he's trying to go to sleep. He says, whoa, I forgot about that. What did we ever do for that guy? And his assistant says, we didn't do anything. What? We got to do something for him. We got to hook him up. What should we, who's here right now? And then Haman walks in, asking permission to kill Mordecai. And the king says, Haman, what should I do for somebody I really want to honor? Somebody I, I just, I want to do something killer for. What should I do? And of course, Haman thinks he's talking about him. So he says, here's what I would do, king. I would put your royal robe on him. And then I would put him on one of your horses with the emblem on it. And I would parade him around the city saying, this is what I do for those the king wants to honor. And the king like, that's an amazing idea. Here's what I want you to do. Go get Mordecai. <laughs> and I want you to do everything you just said. That's, don't leave anything out. That was sweet. Great plan. And so now Haman has to get Mordecai, put the royal robes on him, put him on the king's horse and go, this is what the king does. When he wants to honor someone, and, and he's humiliated. Humiliated. And he goes home and he tells his wife again, you're not going to believe this. Why does this keep happening to me? And it says, so Haman took the robes, put them on Mordecai, placed them on the king's horse. This is how the king honors someone he wishes. And after Mordecai returned to the palace, Haman hurried home, dejected, humiliated. And he told his wife and all his friends what happened. And they said to him, look, this guy's humiliating you. He's of Jewish birth, and none of your plans are going to succeed. I would stop opposing him. And it says, but while they were still talking, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took him into the banquet. So before he can process it, before he can go, maybe I should just leave this alone, he's whisked away to the second banquet. And now it says the king and Haman went to this banquet. On the second occasion, again, they were drinking wine. Again, the king said, tell me what you want, Queen Esther. What's your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. This time, Queen Esther replied, if I found favor with the king, if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. And if we'd been merely sold as slaves, I could have remained quiet. It would be too trivial to even bother the king with something like that. Verse 5, who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded. Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Esther replied, this wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. So she says, it's him. He's trying to kill me. He's trying to kill all of us. The king's like, Ugh! and he's so mad, he runs out into the garden. He's collecting himself. He's saying, okay, get it together. You're not going to kill him right now. You're not, and, he, and it says that he comes back in, but Haman's such a wimp that he's begging for his life. The queen asks, oh, please, don't let him kill me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And the Bible says that she's laying on a couch, and he actually falls on top of her, begging for his life, right as the king comes back in from the garden. So the king's like, all right, I'm just going to talk to him. <gasps> what? First you say you're going to kill her, what? Now you're all up on her? Oh, heck no, this isn't happening. And the king grabs him and says, you're going to, and, and they put the, the mask over, they put a bag over his head, basically sealing his doom. And in that moment, he knows it's over for me. And then one of the assistants says, hey, by the way, he did build a 75-foot pole <laughs> that he was going to kill Mordecai on. Just want to let you know, it's available. And the king says, put him on it. And they impale Haman 
And, and it wasn't even what Haman was doing. He wasn't actually trying to assault her. He just was begging for his life. But sometimes God, even in the midst of your enemies, prepares this table before you and turns the tides. And in that moment, Mordecai went from a dead man walking, literally, to being honored, to being placed in a position of authority, and all of his enemies thwarted in one 24-hour period. Now listen to me. If she had just said the day before when she was going to, none of those things would have happened. God, again, he's not mentioned in the book, but you see his hand. Because in that moment, Haman leaves the party so happy. And then he sees Mordecai not bowing. He's mad. He goes home. He tells his wife. He builds the 75-foot pole. And then the king can't sleep. And just by chance, the story about Mordecai saving his life is read. And he says, oh, we should probably honor him. We should do something. And none of that would have taken place if she had said, here's what I want you to do the first time. Every relationship had changed. Haman's relationship had changed. Mordecai's relationship with the king had changed. And it was the timing of God that led to the complete victory and reversal in the lives of Mordecai and the Jewish people. So never ever refuse to not trust the timing and the goodness of God. Isaiah 55 says his ways are higher, his thoughts are higher. Everything that he does is for your good. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, God is working together for good, all things, to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So when it looked like the end was happening, when it looked like there was no hope, there was nothing that could be done, God moves supernaturally because of the faith and the risk that Esther took in chapter 4. And suddenly all of the enemies of Mordecai were subdued. It says on that chapter 8, on that same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. So all of his money and all of his property was given to the queen and to Mordecai. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king how they were related. Verse 2, the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. So in one day, there's a financial reversal. In one day, there's an authority reversal, where, where the king's given now to Mordecai. And he has authority. And where it looked like he was going to be subject to the enemy, subject to the people who hated him, in one moment, God reversed his destiny. He said, no, now I give you the ring of authority. I give you the keys to the kingdom. The Bible says that instead of the mourning, remember he wore the sackcloth and all of Israel throughout the provinces wailed and cried. Now they're dancing, they're shouting, they're full of joy because God did a reversal in their lives. But I think the most important thing is remembering how he did it. So all of this happens, but then the queen goes before the king and says, look, I need you to revoke the law that Haman made, that all of us are to be killed on this day. I need you to tear that up. I need you to reverse it. And the king says, I can't. I signed it. The law of the Medes and Persians can't be broken. And I felt like what the Lord was saying and is saying to us is that just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're not going to face some battles. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through dry seasons. Doesn't mean you're not going to have some, some things in your life that are not ideal. John 16, says, in the world, you will have tribulation. So God doesn't say, hey, become a Christian and I'm going to protect you in this bubble and nothing bad's going to ever happen to you and you're not going to experience grief or pain or, or, or doubt or any of those things. And if you hear people who say that, they're lying to you. It's not promised to us. But what the king said to Esther is, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a new law. I want there to be a greater reality about what's gonna happen. And in this law, you're gonna give the Jewish people the right to defend themselves. You're gonna give the Jews the right to battle, the right to stand up and say, we don't just have to lay down. We're gonna fight for the breakthrough. We're gonna fight for the reversal. We're gonna fight for God to move on our behalf. And I want you to put the signet ring on that. And that's exactly what God says to us. Not that we're not gonna face things, but that he doesn't just erase circumstances. He gives us a greater authority to live by. He gives us a greater law to govern our lives by. And as we read his word, and as, and, and as we face things, when, when we have grief, when we have pain, we don't just ignore it. 
We look and we say, the Bible says that God gives us a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The Bible says that sorrow may last for the evening, but joy comes in the morning. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And instead of saying, I need to get rid of these things, it's no, I need to declare a greater reality over my life. There's a law, there's things that God has spoken that supersede what the enemy has tried to plan for your life. Finances. We don't just say, God, I need to win the lottery. That's my only hope. No. We say, God says, no, there's a greater law. Are you willing to be a giver? Are you willing to risk? Are you willing to budget? Are you willing to do the things that create momentum for God to do a miracle? Sickness. We don't just deny it. If you have sickness in your body, it's not faith to say, I don't have sickness. No. We don't deny what's the reality. We declare a greater reality. No, there's another law in place. By his stripes, I am healed. The wings of his healing have touched my heart, touched my body. And we develop in the secret place the faith to believe that God has something greater for our lives. That's what the Christian victorious life looks like. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, Thanks be to God who always gives us the victory in Christ Jesus. And the very next verse says, Therefore, be steadfast and immovable. The enemy wants to move you off of the reality that God has already gone before you. God has already given you the victory. We just have to receive it by faith and walk in the blessing and power that he has created through the blood of Jesus Christ. Divine reversals are exactly what God is in the business of doing in our lives. I wanna end with just this last verse. So they send this decree out that the Jews are able to protect themselves. And listen to this. This encapsulates the whole book of Esther, chapter 9, verse 1. So on March 7th, the day that they were supposed to all be killed, the two decrees of the kings were put into effect on that day. And the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them, but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews. It was God's people who overpowered their enemies. So on a day where it was the bleakest, it was the darkest, it was the worst day possible, God superseded and said, no, on this day, when you thought the enemy had control, when you thought he was writing the script to your life, no, quite the opposite can happen. God can open doors that no man can open. God can move mountains in your life. God does the impossible in our lives because he's that good and he's that strong and he loves us that much. Nothing is impossible when you align your life and walk with the goodness and and in alignment with who God is and what he's done. Will you guys stand up with me? I want to just close in prayer. And I just want you to close your eyes and I I want to ask you, and I'm just going to pray, is there things in your life where, where you know I have to trust the timing of God? Things that I hoped would have already happened. I thought I would have met my, my spouse. I thought I would have been beyond this. I, I thought I could have moved past this in my life. Whatever it is, God's saying, trust me in the timing. And the second thing the Lord wanted me to pray for is those in here who need a dramatic reversal in their lives, who need to know that there is an authority that's greater than the circumstances you're going through. And so maybe it's an economic one where you have to trust God for financial breakthrough. Maybe it's in your marriage where the enemy's saying it's over, it won't last, it's done, and God says, no, there's a greater reality. There's a healing, there's a restoration that can happen. Maybe it's a healing in your body. Maybe the enemy's telling you your kids are never gonna serve God, they're never gonna come back to the Lord, and you need to declare a greater reality that says no. The Bible says train up children in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. There's divine reversals that God's in the business of doing. And if that's you and and your head's bowed and your eyes are closed and you say, just include me in that prayer, I want you to raise your hand. If there's something you're believing God for, raise your hand high. Hands all over the room. Yes, this is what God does. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to create it ourselves. We say, God, come and do what only you can do. And Father, I pray over this church. I pray, God, that there would be divine reversals That, Father, where the enemy has come in and tried to bring doubt and fear and worst-case scenarios, you would raise up a standard, God, and that the perfect peace of God surround and guard 
the hearts of your people, God. Where there's been sickness, we declare by faith that by your stripes, we are healed. There is wholeness. There is a balm in Gilead that makes the sinners whole, God, in the name of Jesus. God, you give us joy for our sorrow. You give us worship for the spirit of heaviness, God. You say, God, that nothing, nothing can separate us from your love. So God, where there's been shame, where there's been guilt, where the enemies come with condemnation, Father, bring the spirit of life into our lives. Bring the spirit of truth that says we've not gone too far, that your love is greater than anything we've done wrong in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray, 2 Corinthians 4, the prayer of Paul, over everyone in this room where he said, I might be hard pressed on every side, but I'm not crushed. And I might be perplexed, but I'm not in despair. And I might have been persecuted, but I've not been forsaken. And I may be struck down, but I will not be destroyed because greater is he who is in me than he that is in the world. And we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. And Father, our testimony is that Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, every lack, every sickness, every lie of the enemy bows its knee to the name of Jesus in this place. And God, I pray that you would send us, just like Esther, risking it all to see your kingdom come and your will be done in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Can we do that today? It's good. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to dismiss you. Our prayer partners are going to be up here. And here's all I want to say is if you're believing God for a miracle in your life. There is a power that is released when we pray. This is what we do at Radiant Church is we join our faith and we say, let's believe God to move the mountains in our lives. And so if you need to give your heart to the Lord, if you're believing for a family member, if you're believing for breakthrough in some area of your life, find someone that you can pray and agree with God with. And as you leave this place, remember, we don't leave the church. We leave as the church where we're called to be salt and light to the world around us. God bless you. You're dismissed. Enjoy this beautiful day. We'll see you back here next week.